Welcome to science class. Today we will be talking about science. Rather than teaching you what the scientific method is, I instead want to talk about what sets science apart as a completely unique style of learning. I also want to touch on the big picture of how science has changed our world. Of course, I won't be able to do this justice in the time we have, but your relationship with the world and how you view science should be up to you. You don't need me or anybody else to tell you what it means to you. I can just give you the facts. Let's get started. I consulted the internet and I found that science is defined as the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Yikes. How about this? Science is the process of figuring out how stuff works. Now you might be thinking to yourself, that's the most obvious thing I've ever heard. But is it? You see, science is the opposite of intuition, luck, faith, speculation, authority, and I would argue we are far more inclined to use those methods rather than scientific ones in our day-to-day -day lives. And actually, that's completely fair. After all, if you made every decision you do every day follow a scientific framework, well, you'd barely get anything done. It takes time. Scientists work very carefully because they're not trying to figure out what ought to be, but what is. Science is concerned with knowing what is true. So if you just feel like having pancakes for breakfast, then go ahead, that's the right decision to make. Now the word science has only existed as we understand it for around 250 years. The word scientist was coined in 1834 by Cambridge historian William Hewell. People who studied the natural world before were called natural philosophers. In places such as ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, and the Middle East, they didn't practice what we would consider science. This is especially surprising considering the unbelievable architectural achievements of these civilizations. Famous figures from history who we think of as scientists, such as Aristotle, Archimedes, Pythagoras, did not use the scientific method. They guessed. Now to be fair, many of these men were great mathematicians, which was the greatest contribution, arguably, apart from democratic government that the Greeks gave us. The reason you cannot name a single Roman mathematician is because there pretty much weren't any. The Romans had no use for math other than practical uses. Don't believe me? Just try adding or multiplying Roman numerals. It's a disaster. Anyways, today we call this kind of non-experimental reasoning armchair philosophy, and unfortunately, it's still very common. Listen to any two politicians lay out their philosophy on economics, trade, immigration, or healthcare, and you'll notice that they are usually just saying, trust me, I just know. Francis Bacon invented the scientific method as we understand it today in his book Novum Organum, published in 1620. The work of early astronomers, such as Copernicus and Galileo, were major influences to Bacon. Now, as stated earlier, science is the practice of discovering what is true. Science tends to be concerned only with natural explanations. Science avoids addressing questions of value directly. However, I think that science is what shapes our moral compass. I credit science not just for our technological achievements over the last 500 years, but also our escape from brutality, capital punishment, racism, sexism, and ignorance. Okay, maybe those last three still need a lot of work, but you'd be amazed just how far we've come in relatively little time. Before the modern scientific movement, People's values, attitudes, and what they knew was quite different. Now, I should state clearly here that in this discussion and most of the others, I will display a heavy bias towards the United States and Western culture and ideas as a whole. 
that is, countries and regions influenced by the Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman, and Enlightenment traditions. That being said, let's think about life for many people living in Europe in the 1500s. People who lived at that time were majority spiritual and Christian, and they relied on their beliefs to guide their opinion, like a lot of Americans do today. However, unlike a lot of Americans today, people living only 500 years ago knew that witches exist and place curses on people, mice, flies, and other animals popped into existence randomly, a murdered body would bleed in the presence of the murderer, ointment applied to a blade would cure the wound it created, the shape, color, and texture of plants could tell you if it was useful as medicine because God designed nature to be interpreted by humans. Comets were signs of impending doom. The earth is at rest and the whole universe rotates around it. Death was an appropriate penalty for stealing, mixing with the wrong socioeconomic class, speaking poorly of the monarchy or the Vatican, thinking the earth orbits the sun. People of color were created by God to be subservient to whites. A monarchy had a divine right to rule, therefore any of their laws were passed down from God. External forces controlled everybody's daily life, and everything happens, quote, for a reason. Now, that last one is a nice idea, but the rest of these are so absurd that talking to the average person living in England at the time would probably be somewhere between infuriating and heartbreaking for a lot of us. Many of those ideas were not unique to that time or place. In fact, all of that nonsense, plus a lot more, had been the status quo for 2,000 or more years. So how did we ever break the spell? Well, let's look at a brief period in time between a revolutionary new technology and a revolutionary new way of viewing our own existence. In 1820, the world literacy rate was 12%. Today, it's 83% globally. But in developed worlds, it's practically 100%. Great Britain, for example, saw its literacy rate increase from around 5% to nearly 50% between the 13th and 17th century. But this progress began much earlier than that. This is thanks almost entirely to technology, specifically the printing press. What were the broader effects of people being able to read and educate themselves? Let's look at an admittedly condensed timeline of Europe. From around 500 CE to 1300 were the so-called Dark Ages. Not a single notable achievement in any of the sciences or in human rights occurred in Europe in this time. China and Baghdad were flourishing, but sadly we won't have time for that today. Then from 1400 to 1600 came the Renaissance, where art, commerce, and early science flourished. Part of this was due to the incredible wealth achieved by nations. But the printing press allowed the sharing of ideas, and by extension, the improvement of ideas. For the last 2,000 years, if your ideas did not agree with Aristotle or the Bible, well then your ideas were considered wrong. You know, ideas like the earth orbits the sun. Then came the modern scientific revolution. Though none of these, quote, events really have solid beginning and ending dates, the scientific revolution is usually credited with the publication of De Revolutionaries, Copernicus's book which outlines the framework for heliocentrism. Inspired by these works, many other astronomers and mathematicians made their own discoveries, and one of them, Isaac Newton, went on to invent calculus, just so he could work out the details of elliptical orbits observed by Johannes Kepler. In just 144 years, astronomy built the backbone of modern physics and the Industrial Revolution followed swiftly after. And if you don't know why that's important, I suggest you simply revisit any history class offered ever. Then from 1715 to 1789 came the Enlightenment, the great flourishing of human rights, and the adoption of democratic governments throughout the New World and Europe. 
just look at the way in which violent crime and punishment plummeted through this time in history, and you'll be amazed. I find it no coincidence that all of these events occurred in rapid succession after people were free to educate themselves privately. No longer did oral tradition reign supreme. No longer could those who held the books tell us what they said. No longer did discoveries have to be made independently. Our wisdom became collective, and we began to see each other and the universe in new and exciting ways. Things can only hold power over us as long as we remain ignorant of them. The more people learned, the less they had to fear. Comets became predictable objects in the sky, not bad omens. Everything good or bad happens because of natural causes, not supernatural reasons. Can you imagine living in a time where we feared for our lives in the event that a shiny new object would appear in the sky? Written in the Declaration of Independence is the idea that all men are created equal and that they all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That wasn't just a radical idea for people 500 years ago. It was a radical idea much more recently than that. Our bloodiest war was fought over whether African Americans could be held against their will as property, or if they should, instead, have their own autonomy. But it is an idea that only ever came about after centuries and millennia of struggle. If it could have happened without science and reason, then it would have. There was more than enough time. If this feels like a history lesson, that's because it is. The reasons that science is important are historical. Now, what we have covered so far happened long enough ago that not even your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents lived through it. Kind of like how none of you know what dial-up internet was like. Or weekend minutes. So, now you'll want to know, what has science done for me lately? Well, after the Industrial Revolution, sparked by Newton's mathematical genius, we began to be able to do more work and build better tools and share more information. And countries were wealthy enough to pay people to be scientists for a living instead of in their free time. Almost nobody in history ever had this job until the Industrial Revolution. Here are the results of having a dedicated class of professional scientists. Global life expectancy in 1913 was 34 years old. Today it's 71.4 years. And in more developed countries, you can expect to live 10 years beyond that. The percentage of people who died before age 5 in 1900 globally was 36.2%. Today it's 4.25% and lower than 1% in more developed countries. Calvin Coolidge's son died while he was in office from an infected blister on his foot he got while playing tennis. That was the world we lived in less than a hundred years ago. The number of people killed by smallpox in the 20th century has been estimated at 300 million. But all of those deaths occurred between 1900 and 1977 because nobody on earth has died from smallpox since then. Vaccines made the most deadly virus on Earth go extinct in a few decades. GDP per capita in the United States in 1900 was $6,822 in 2011 currency, whereas today it's over $53,000. A hundred selected scientists since the 1800s have been credited with saving more than 5 billion lives from starvation and disease. One of the most important things to understand with scientific progress is that it tends to lift up the poorest and most helpless of all of us, far more dramatically than the wealthiest of us. They already have everything. It continuously shrinks the division between the haves and the have-nots. Control of the five most deadly infectious diseases has saved more than 100 million children since 1990 alone. The most malnourished country in the world, Rwanda, in 1965, was still better fed than France in 1700, who enjoyed perhaps the highest standard of living in the world at that time. Global malnourishment is 13% today, but it was 50% as recently as 1947. 
a combine can gather the same amount of grain in six minutes that 25 men could harvest working an entire day in 1850. Nitrogen fertilizers were almost entirely responsible for the population growth of the 20th century. In 1900, there were 1.65 billion people. Now there are nearly 7.5 billion. We can grow 250% the amount of food per acre we could 100 years ago. For the first 200,000 years of human existence, poor people starved to death. Now, thanks to science and the supermarket, with its cheap but mostly terrible food, our poor citizens, ironically, are going through an obesity crisis. Now, that is a lot of information to take in. But that's the point. This is all good news. And guess what? It keeps getting better. We tend to think most of the big discoveries have already been made. But every generation has made that mistake. Science is our crowning achievement and our saving grace. So long as we do not abandon it or become stagnant thinking we have run out of problems to solve, it will continue to improve all of our lives. Thanks for watching.